I love that song. Amen. What a great encouraging word. That's straight from the word of God this morning. And uh, maybe it'll inspire you this week to go look at that story in the book of Ezekiel. And I remember preaching on that, I think my first year here as pastor, and it just, it just really just challenged my heart. So what a great, great song to begin uh, this service and this worship time, and specifically this time of the word. Well, how many of you know the coach named Lou Holtz? Yeah, some of you don't like him too much, do you? <laughs> maybe if you're a Navy fan like Mike, I don't think he's too fond of Notre Dame. But he was the coach of Notre Dame for many, many years. And uh, Lou Holtz says, um, there are four things that everyone needs in life. How many of you all have heard this before? Four things that everyone needs in life. He says, everyone needs something to do, someone to love, something to believe, and something to look forward to. It's pretty good, right? Everyone needs something to do, someone to love, something to believe in, and something to look forward to. And it's that last point that I really want to hammer down on today. We all need something to look forward to. My question this morning is simply, what keeps you going in the Christian life? What thought gives you strength in your time of need? What are you looking forward to as a believer in Jesus Christ? In your darkest moment, in your darkest time in life, what do you have to hold on to, to cling to? Here's the question. What is your hope? What is the believer's hope this morning? I want you to turn real quickly to the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. And as you turn there, I want you to listen to uh, Colossians. Don't go to Colossians, go to Corinthians. But I want you to listen to Colossians because this is where this sermon was kind of born, all right? This is where the message started as we were going through the short series a few weeks ago talking about what makes a strong church, what makes a strong believer. And we were in the book of Colossians, and I came across Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And it says, so just listen this morning, it says in Colossians 1, 4 and 5, Paul says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. You remember speaking about that? You remember talking about that? You remember when I preached about having faith? And it's not just faith in God in general or faith in things, but faith specifically in Jesus Christ. And then we said that that faith turned into something because the scriptures show us in verse 4, he says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. So we saw that correlation. We saw that true faith produces love for the brethren, right? Love for the other members of the church. But then verse 5, listen to verse 5. If you're listening, say amen. amen. He says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. So he says, listen, the faith that you have and the love that you have, where does that come from? It comes from a hope. And so my question to you today and to myself this morning is what is the believer's hope? I want you to keep your place in 1 Corinthians and I want you to go to the book of Acts. You're like, what are we doing today, Dave? Uh, everybody do this real quick. Everybody do this. Spirit fingers. Okay? Spirit fingers. Come on, get them up. Spirit fingers. Come on. Who's got the best spirit fingers? You don't want to be the best at this if you're a guy, right? Okay? Get them ready because we're going to be turning a lot in the scriptures this morning. There's a few scriptures on screen, but most of them are in the Bible. So we're going, to be, we're going to be turning back and forth to different scriptures. So go to Acts chapter 23. I want you to look at Acts chapter 23. And we're going to look at chapter 23 and a little bit of chapter 24. We're going to skip around quite a bit today. So if you're mentally with me, say a loud hallelujah. hallelujah. That was great. Good job, church. Amen. Acts chapter 23, and I have purposely not marked my Bible, so it takes me about the same time to get to it as you do. So don't worry uh, if it takes us a little time together. We're going to spend it in the Word of God this morning. Acts chapter 23 and verse number 6. Listen to what Paul says. It says, But perceiving that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the council. He's before the council, and listen to what he says. Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope 
and resurrection of the dead. I want you to just go to the next chapter, chapter 24, and look at verse number 15. Paul is speaking again, and he says, Having a, what? Hope in God, which these men cherish themselves, that there shall certainly be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Now go to verse number 21 of same chapter, chapter 24. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. He says in verse 21, Other than for this one statement which I shouted out while standing among them, for the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you today. Paul gives us a, basically, a basic one-word definition of what he's talking about and what the New Testament is talking about when he's talking about the resurrection. It's not simply only the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saying it's the resurrection of every believer who's ever lived. You see, the Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection, right? But the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, and Paul kind of gets on their good side by saying, listen, I'm on trial for proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. What is the believer's hope? To put it very clearly and plainly and in your first point, above number one, the very top of the page, the believer's hope is the resurrection. Again, when you think of resurrection in terms of Christendom, what do you think of? You think about the cross. You think about Christ, and that is true. That is our main source of hope. But by default, when Christ arose, we got something in return. We had the hope of our resurrection. And so that's what we want to kind of simply focus in on today. It's not simply the resurrection of Christ, but the ramifications of the resurrection of Jesus, which is our resurrection. The believer's hope is the resurrection. That's the main thought that we're going to go through all the next points, all right? So I need you to say it with me this morning. If you're with me, you ready? The believer's hope is the resurrection. Again, the believer's hope is the resurrection, okay? That is our hope as believers in Jesus Christ. And we're going to basically flesh that out and ask this question, what does resurrection mean for me on a practical level? You say, well, that's great, Dave, you know, that's, that's neat. But what does that mean for me? And I'm going to give you four points this morning, what it truly means for you. And my, my purpose this morning was, is with the Word of God to encourage you, to uplift you, to give you something to look forward to. And I know that God will do it through His Word this morning. What does the resurrection mean for me? Number one, it means a new body. And all God's people said, some of us more than others, right? I woke up this morning, something's going on with my neck and my back, and I'm just like, what is happening, right? Seems like every day I get older and older, and every day something new breaks down. <laughs> Amen? But the hope for the believer is that we get a new body. Now, I told you to keep your place in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want you to go there now. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're excited about flipping around in the Word of God and reading a lot of the Word of God, would you say a hearty amen this morning? Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to be looking at verses 42 through 44, and then we'll flip over a little bit to verses 51 through 58. I want us to just really digest a lot of the Word this morning so we can really understand our hope. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 42, says this, so also is the resurrection of the dead, hence what we've been speaking about. It is, a, it is sown in a perishable, perishable body, it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Now go over to verse 51 of the same chapter. It says in verse 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Now when he speaks of sleep here, it's just a gentle term for death, okay? That's understood. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be what? Changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised 
Here's that word again we just saw a little while ago. Imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on the immortal. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable. And this mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written. Death. I'm sorry, about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. We get an imperishable body. This body breaks down. This body decays. This body is constantly getting worse. And the scriptures say that we get, at the resurrection of our bodies, we get an imperishable body. It will never perish. Amen? What a great, great thought for the believer. Resurrected bodies don't get sick. Resurrected bodies don't get cancer. Resurrected bodies don't die. Resurrected bodies don't have knee pain. Resurrected bodies don't have headaches. Resurrected bodies don't have sinusitis. <laughs> Resurrected bodies don't have back injuries. Resurrected bodies don't become weary. They don't be, d- become despondent. They don't despair. They don't get discouraged. They don't get depressed. Anybody ever deal with any of that in your life? You see, sometimes as believers in Jesus Christ, we think, oh, if we get depressed, something's wrong with us. No, it's a proof that we're still in this body and that there's a body to come that gets rid of all that. No more depression, no more sickness, no more tears, no more worry, no more health issues. Amen? Amen. Man, that is exciting to know as a believer in Jesus Christ that one day you and I will have new bodies changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 is not on the screen. Just listen. It says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. You see, it's not just our bodies. It's our minds. There are some things that you've been asking for a long time. There's a question that's been going on in your head, and it's this question, why? Why? Why did this happen? Why did that happen to this loved one? Why did I lose this person? And when we are resurrected in our resurrected bodies, not only are our physical bodies changed, but many things, I believe many things that happen in this life, the Lord will reveal to us And we'll see fully. You see, in that time, mirrors were dim and they were kind of foggy and they weren't as crystal clear as they are today. And so they looked in the mirror and you didn't see perfectly. But when we die and when we get into our resurrected bodies, we will see perfectly. We will, in essence, have the perfect mind of Christ. Our hope is in a new body. I want you to say that with me this morning. I want you to say, my hope. Ready? Is in a new body. My hope is in a new body. That should give you some, some courage, some energy. Whatever you're going through physically in your life this day, take heart. One day it will be no more. It's a little bit easier to get through some painful things, some physical, uh, some physical pain and things like that when you know that there's an end in sight. Amen. And our hope as believers in Jesus Christ is a new body. But secondly, our hope is an inheritance. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 5 is on the screen. You don't have to turn there this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. And follow along as I read. And I'd like you to read out loud this morning. Would you all do that with me? Amen? Amen. Let's read it together. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 
to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Did you see it right there in the middle? I even highlighted it for you. Listen to what he says. It has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That is, you have a hope right now, a living hope. It's alive. It's not dead. It's a living hope. Through who? Through what? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To do what? To obtain, there it is, an inheritance, which is, that word keeps popping up over and over, doesn't it? Imperishable. Not only will our bodies not perish, but our inheritance will never perish. And undefiled, that is, there is no sin or malady to it, and will not fade away. Anybody ever wash a, clo- a piece of clothing that you just loved and it just began to fade and fade and fade, right? Your inheritance will never fade. It will never change in the slightest bit. It will remain the same for all of eternity. And we receive an inheritance as Christians. Now flip over to the book of Revelation. This is a beautiful passage in Sunday school. Mike actually uh, read from it this morning. Revelation chapter 21. Because I want you to see with your own God-given eyeballs what you and I will receive. Revelation chapter 21. And then we're also going to look at verses 1 through 4. And then look at 10 through 27. So Revelation chapter 21 When you're there, say amen. Amen. Revelation 21, beginning in verse 1. Who's speaking here? John. John says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any mourning, or any death, excuse me, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. Now I want you to go to verse number 10. Verse number 10 of chapter 21 says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were, there were three gates on the east side and three gates on the north and three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones. And on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles on the Lamb. Now listen this morning. This is, this is not make-believe. This is not a fairy tale. This is a real, physical city on the new earth. It's the new heaven come down to the new earth. And listen, keep continuing to read verse 15. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as the width. And he's measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured its wall 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper. And the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. Okay, ladies, I'm probably going to mess up some of these names of these stones, all right? So y'all forgive me. (laughs) But you might know them a little bit better than I do because the Bible, well, not the Bible. People say that diamonds are a girl's best friend, right? So let's just give me some grace this morning. Listen to what it says. The first foundation stone was jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, sardius. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysophase. The eleventh, jacinth. jacinth, The twelfth, amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. 
Each one of the gates were a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it, and nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a beautiful picture. Do you know that's part of your inheritance? I can almost hear Paul, I can almost hear John saying in his best Oprah voice, you get a city. You get a city. You get a city. Right? The believer not only gets a new city, but there's a new earth. There are some beautiful things in this world. There are some beautiful mountaintops and some beautiful beaches. But I has not seen nor ear heard what God hath prepared for those who love him. Right? We begin to think about our inheritance. You see, we are joint heirs with Christ. We are brothers and sisters of Christ. And what he inherits, we inherit because of his work, not because of what we have done. What a great home. How many of you love your home? You put a lot of work into your home. Maybe you cut the grass. Maybe you paint the walls in your home and you try to keep your home up and keep it looking well. And we take pride in our homes and we take uh, pleasure in, 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 in beautifying our homes. And you compare our homes to this. <laughs> wow. What an amazing thought. You see, most people think about heaven. They think, oh, the white clouds and harps and little angels flying around, little baby angels, right? (laughs) Couldn't be more further from the truth. Heaven is going to be a beautiful home that we inherit. And if you think about heaven, you think about our Father is there, our Savior is there, our redeemed family is there, our names are written there. Our life will be there. Our inheritance will be there. Our citizenship is there. Our reward is there. Our treasures are there. Our eternal peace is there. Our eternal satisfaction is there. Our eternal joy is there. And yet, for some odd reason, we live like we're going to live here forever. You have a greater hope than this world. You have a greater inheritance than anything you could ever own in this life and in this world. Our hope is an inheritance. Amen? Amen. So the next time you get jealous of somebody else's car or house or money or job or whatever, remember, you have an eternal inheritance. But not only do we have an eternal inheritance and a new body to look forward to, but we also understand that the believer's hope is an end to sin. For me, this elicits probably the strongest, second strongest amen. An end to sin. Romans, if you turn there, Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. We're almost done turning to different scriptures, but I want you to go to the book of Romans. I want you to see if you can relate with Paul this morning. Romans chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 15 through 24. A familiar passage. Many of you have probably read it before. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 7 beginning in verse 15. He says, For what I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do. But I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now... No longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. Verse 19, for the good that I want I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. 
For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Verse 25, Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. What is Paul saying? He's saying what every single one of us has said. The good things that you intend to do and don't do, right? The good things that you plan to do. I want to get better. I want to do this. I want to help. I want to serve. I want to live like that. That's what I don't do. But the things that I don't want to do, the things that I don't want to participate in, the sin that I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And he concludes it by saying, oh, wretched man that I am. There's frustration in the great apostle Paul. And there's frustration in you and me. Because in this life, we will always deal with the sin nature, with the sin flesh. And to know that one day, one day when we get our resurrected bodies, we will no longer deal with sin. Praise God. No longer dealing with sin. You see, your pastor is a sinner. He's a dirty, rotten sinner that can't get over his sin nature. Amen? Amen. <laughs> I am. I am a sinner through and through. Now, does that mean I don't fight against my sin and try to walk in the Spirit of God and let the Word of God re renew my mind? I do those things. But guess what? I still fall daily. And the person that says, I don't sin, the Bible says that they're a liar and the truth of God is not in them. There is something so energetic, so powerful, so awe-inspiring, so encouraging, so hope-filled to the thought that there will be an end to sin. Praise God. I can't wait for that day. And God promises us that day. In 1 Peter 1, 13, the, second, the latter part of that verse, it says, Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Many believers' problem is the simple fact that our hope is somewhere down here. And Scripture over and over and over says our hope should be up there. We let things in this life tear us down, break us down, worry us. Oh, that didn't do right. That didn't sell. I didn't get that job. I didn't, uh, my relationship's not going well. And we put hope in so many other things than what God has told us to put hope in. We put hope in money. We put hope in our children. If they'll just grow up and be what I want them to be, then, then I'll be happy. God calls us to place our hope completely. The word of God is perfect in every way, and there's no accident when he puts that word there. To put our hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. John MacArthur says it like this. He says, upon the appearing of Jesus Christ, when he is fully disclosed to you in the next world, you will at that point be given the greatest gift of grace, and that is eternal perfection in heaven. The grace of God is not done here in this world. When we enter heaven and we have our resurrected bodies, perfection in terms of no sin. Amen? What an amazing, amazing thought. So our hope is a new body. Our hope is an inheritance. Our hope is an end to sin. And lastly, here's the greatest of them all. Are you ready? Say amen. amen. Our hope as believers is our eternal life with Jesus. The rest of the things mean nothing compared to to an eternal life. And here's the two most important words. With Jesus. Amen. If that doesn't excite you, heaven won't excite you. 
Heaven is being with Jesus Christ. You see, absent from the body, present with the Lord. You can take away the gold streets, those are nice. You can take away the pearls, you can take away the gems, you can take away the crystal sea, you can take away the beautiful surroundings. Just give me Jesus. That's what our hearts as believers in this world should be longing for now. Not church, not the things of this world. Those are not necessarily bad things. Our hope is in a person. That's what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. It's not a religion, it's a relationship. And the hope that we have is a person, not an event, not a place. It's Jesus himself. I want you to turn to one more passage, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians, I'll give you some time to get there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is where we're going. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're wrapping up. This morning, but I want you to see some things as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you're there, say amen. amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. If you're not there, just listen. Verse number 13 is where we're at. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. There's that word again, it's those who have passed away. So that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no, what? Hope. Verse 14 of chapter 4. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. What's he saying? He's saying the dead in Christ will rise first. He's talking about the resurrection. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Listen to this last phrase. Are you listening? Say amen. Amen. And so we shall always be, three words, with the Lord. Lord, that is our hope, to always and forever be with the Lord. Our minds and our hearts can't even fathom what this truly means. There is no greater pleasure, no greater joy, no greater love than to eternally be with Jesus Christ. Luke 23, 43, Jesus said to the man on the cross, you remember there was one on his right and one on his left, and the one... That was mocking him, and there was another who believed in him. And he said to this man, truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. Sometimes we focus on paradise, we focus on everything else. Jesus promised to him was that he would be with him. That was the hope that he was giving this man. John 14, 3, Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am... There you may be also. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8 is on the screen. And I'd like you to look at this with me this morning. It says, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. That is, when we are in this flesh, when we are alive on this earth, we are not with the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. That is, we are confident. We are strongly firmly, solidly placed in what we know. Why? Because I say I prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. He preferred to be dead. Fleshly dead. Can we say that? That our desire, our heart's desire is more, is greater to be with the Lord in the presence of the Lord than simply in our own fleshly bodies here on this earth. You see, the believer's hope is eternal life with Jesus. Richard Baxter was a hymn writer. Listen to his words. If you're listening, say amen. Amen. These were some of his words he wrote. He said, my knowledge of this life is small. The eye of faith is dim, but tis enough that Christ knows all, and I shall be with him. Powerful words. 
If you're not excited about being with Christ, one of two things is happening. Either A, you don't know Christ, or B, your relationship with him is not what it ought. It's not what it ought be. Our hope is a new body, is an inheritance, is an end to sin, and is eternal life with Jesus Christ. So what? What's the practical takeaway this morning? You see, many of you maybe have just kind of checked out, and, and I've seen that a little bit. But this, this will drive your life as a believer in Jesus. This will spur you on when things get tough. Not just the new body or the inheritance or the end to sin, but life with Jesus. Because, you see, when you got saved, your eternal life with Jesus started that day. It started at that time. It started at that moment. And maybe you're not giving that relationship the attention that it deserves. If you're going to spend eternity with somebody, don't you think it might be good to get to know them before you cross over into eternity? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I'm just going to read this. I'll go there here in a moment. I want you to take some practical things. These are not in your notes, but I'd like you to write them down. Because it's no good to hear this and you think, wow, Dave, that's encouraging. That's, that's a great message. I can't wait. Uh, that gives me hope. But I want you to take some very practical thoughts away this morning. And so 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 58 says this. And we already read it once today. He says, therefore, he says, because of what we get, because of the inheritance, because of a new body, because of all the things that the, that the believer gets, he says this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Listen to what he says. Knowing, knowing, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You see, sometimes you and I get discouraged in the work of the Lord, right? Sometimes people don't act the way we want them to act. Sometimes things don't go the way we want them to go. Sometimes we don't have the results that the world says that we should have. And we become despondent, we despair, we become depressed and discouraged. But listen to what he says is the key. Knowing that your toil is not in vain. Why? Why? Because of the hope that we have. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is is not in vain. You see, we have rewards as believers, don't we? We have rewards as believers in Jesus Christ. I want you to write this phrase down in your notes somewhere. Our future hope allows for our present perseverance. Our future hope allows for our present perseverance. The way that we keep going in the work of the Lord, the way that we keep persevering in the work of the ministry The way that we continue on and persevere is because of our hope in Jesus Christ. A hope to a new body, our hope in an inheritance, a hope to an end in sin, and a hope in eternal life with Jesus himself. That's the first thing that we must take away. Our future hope allows for our present perseverance. And secondly... In 1 Peter 3.15, you don't have to turn there. I'm almost done. It says this, always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks of the hope that is in you. This is number two this morning in terms of practical. Share the hope. Because many of you checked out and you're like, well, that's good. I've got to, I'm going to get a new body. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get... And you forgot how selfish we are about the hope that we have. If you believe that you will and I will get a new body, get an inheritance, get an end to sin, and get eternal life with Jesus, how much more should we be sharing that hope with others? It's easy to be encouraged this morning. The hard part is when the challenge comes from the Word of God. As Christians, we're to be sharing the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? So take those two things this morning. Bury them in your head and in your heart. 
the resurrection, our resurrected bodies, what it comes down to for you and me is it helps us persevere. And then knowing that for ourselves, we should be sharing that hope. This Wednesday night, we have a new series coming up called Tell Someone. What do you think that's about? It's simply telling someone about the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I'll challenge you to be there. I challenge you to come and to attend and to commit and to learn how to share the hope that is within you so that when somebody asks you, you can share your hope with them. Would you bow with me this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend.